All right, so tonight, uh, one thing that I, I haven't always done this, even in these last almost four years uh, here, I, I haven't always done this, but one thing I, I like to do and I try to do as often as I can is use Wednesday night as a bridge between Sundays. Uh, because here's what I've found in, in my years of ministry thus far. Almost never do we really exhaust the passage of Scripture we're studying on a Sunday morning. Almost never. Uh, that would be the exception, I, I, would, I would think. So, so I say that because... Wednesday night, then, uh, is a good opportunity for us halfway between the Sunday we just finished and the Sunday that's coming up uh, because of my, uh, my style or method of preaching the Word where we're going through a book of the Bible in its context. So we all know what's coming this Sunday because we know what just came last Sunday. So if we just finished up verse 10 in Galatians 1... This Sunday's verse eleven and to the end of chapter one, so it's all in, in you know in context. So I like to use this as a bridge to try to go a little deeper into what we studied on Sunday, and then connect, like like uh, revisit this past Sunday and prepare for the coming Sunday. That that's kind of how I view Wednesday night is a good opportunity to do that. So in light of that, this past Sunday we were in Galatians one. 6 through 10, and Paul's main thrust in that little paragraph was he was, he was fussing almost about how the church was um, deserting the gospel. The, the main foundation of the church is the belief in the gospel, the good news of Christ and how he lived and died and rose and what that, uh, how the implications affect us. And so he's now going to transition beginning in verse 11 through the end of chapter 1 to more of a personal experience here's where i've been here's what i've said here's who i've seen and talked to and here's what we discussed and this is why the gospel is so important and so tonight i thought well what better subject to discuss than the gospel itself let's be sure if paul is going to such great lengths to uh, teach the people the importance, the the necessary elements of the gospel. That this is this is um, what's the word non negotiable. This this is a critical knowledge and belief for the church. So let's talk about the gospel. So I've got this book, and and we're going to be. I'll I'll go ahead and point you toward uh, Romans. And we're kind of going to do a broad stroke here, not um, not my normal deal of this little paragraph, but we're going to be starting in Romans one and seeing some some ways where Paul uh, explains the gospel in the first few chapters of Romans. And so I, I want to commend a book to you if you like to read, and especially. These are so accessible because they're small and short, and you, you can read it in an afternoon, no problem. And this book is by Greg Gilbert, and it's called What is the Gospel? It's one of the most helpful books because isn't that a good question? We're t Paul's talking about how important the gospel is. You can't live without the gospel. Don't, don't leave the gospel. Stay, you know. Well, what is that exactly? And so this is a really, really good book, and I've, I've uh, read it a few times. I kind of used it today to kind of look back and to um, frame the discussion for tonight. So um, in Romans, at the very beginning, and because, uh, because of the nature of the letter, uh, Romans is probably the most theologically, um, I don't know, I was going to say theologically sound, but it's all theologically sound if it's in the Bible. But it's a, it's a theological masterpiece, Romans is. And, uh, and so it's so helpful, especially when we're talking about something as foundational as the gospel. And this is where we get 
um, a very well-known and often used evangelistic tool, the Roman road. I've got a Bible, a particular, I've got several Bibles in my office, but one in particular where on the very first page of Romans, I've got a little post-it note with about eight scripture references that just takes you right through the Roman road in case you forget it. It tells you exactly where to go. And of course, I've done that enough now to where I don't need to post a note, but it's still there because I just kind of just re- is a reminder that that's that's what that's there for. So where does the gospel begin? You know, Paul alludes to that in several of the letters he's written, but in Romans, he's really, really direct and specific. And he begins, the first time he uses that word is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And it's not, he hasn't explained it yet, but he just says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then he tells, tells these, he's writing to Roman Christians, but this is why he's not ashamed, because it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe. So that, that's a huge statement. Where, where do we find salvation? How do we... How do we get there? And Paul says, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because that's how we get there. Okay, so then he spends the next good good little bit of the letter at the beginning explaining about the gospel and telling them what's going on. He develops this gospel principle in really about the first four or five, even six chapters of this letter. So what I wanted to do tonight is summarize to help us all uh, have like a little refresher to say okay what if somebody asked you hey could you explain the gospel to me I mean do you know right now just right off the on the tip of your tongue could you have a good explanation of the gospel for someone if they just walked up to you and asked you hey explain the gospel to me I and, and, and I don't have any frame of reference, just I don't know anything. Tell me about the gospel. I mean, that's, that's a great opportunity, but would we be prepared for that? And even if we have done that before, this is a, this is a, a, a story, a true story, that you can never tell too many times. You can never study too much. Uh, it's always good. In fact... It's a good practice to preach the gospel to yourself every day. To remind yourself of the truth of who Christ is, what Christ has done, and why that is so important. So we're going to go through a a couple of uh, sections here in the first few chapters of Romans. And then I'm going to tie it together with, uh, we're going to kind of take a, uh, let me put it in terms of like uh, flying in an airplane. We're going to take a a, a 500-foot view, and then we're going to go up and take about a 30,000-foot view. See the the kind of a micro story and then a macro story, and see how those relate, okay? So here's some things we know about the gospel. The first thing is, we are accountable to God. We're accountable to God. The, the story begins, as I said, verse 16, Paul says he's not ashamed. But then, right in verse 18, in Romans 1, we read that God's wrath is revealed from heaven. Okay? So the wrath of God is revealed to us, which tells us uh, humanity is not autonomous. Uh, we did not create ourselves okay and if we didn't create ourselves that means ultimately we are not in charge of ourselves we are accountable to someone else okay and that someone else is God he's the creator we're not self-reliant and we are not self-accountable God is the creator therefore he has a particular unique position that no one else has He created us, so we are um, indebted to him in every way. We're accountable to him. Right below verse 18, after 
uh, Paul writes that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who, by the way, at the end of verse 18, by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. And this is an argument that I've long made about uh, this existence of self-proclaimed atheist or even agnostic because I don't believe such a person really truly exists. I believe anyone who would call themselves an atheist or an agnostic falls into this category of Romans 1.18, suppress the truth. And here's why I think that. There is not a human being who has ever existed or who ever exists now that was not created by God in his image. And because every single human being is an image bearer of God, and he has placed eternity in our hearts, I, I, I am of the firm conviction that there is no such thing as an atheist. The truth is being pressed down because it is inconvenient, and it affects our lives. And when we don't want it to affect our lives, we suppress it and push it down as far as we can to get away from it. And, and I honestly believe that's ultimately what is happening and what has happened in many people. You get on a little further in Romans 1, this idea that we are accountable to God. Verse 21 tells us that it says, Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this reinforces my conviction about no such thing really as an atheist because they knew God. They just didn't honor Him as God. They pushed that truth so far down they for, just chose to forget about it because it didn't match with their sinful desires. That, that's, what, that's what I believe is happening. But ultimately, it's God to whom we are accountable. Number two, our problem is that we rebelled against God. That's our, our foundational problem. We have not honored God, as the Bible says, and we have not given thanks to Him as we should have. So when we see uh, verse 23, Romans 1, 23, this is uh, all through chapter 1, we see uh, several instances of this same phrase, we exchange some things. So verse 23 says, They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So you know what that is? That's a description of idolatry. We didn't honor God. We didn't give thanks to God. We exchanged the glory of of the immortal God for images. And, it, and all that list is just different examples of images. In other words, even though we could behold the master of the universe, we declared in our own minds and hearts that there was something else, someone else, something more valuable than God. Could be any number of things. Idols, uh, that's, a, that's a wide category. But, but we have determined in our lack of wisdom, I almost said in our wisdom, now I realize that would be wrong. Uh, we've determined that there's something in this world more valuable than God. And idolatry is the root and essence of of sin. It, it, what, what are the first two commandments in the Ten Commandments? Number one, you will have no gods before me. Number two, you will make for yourself no idols. That's number one and two. In priority order, no other gods, no idols. And really, if we get those right, the rest of them kind of start to fall into place a little better, a little easier. But we, we've missed it from the very beginning. The, the very first priority 
no other gods. We messed it up. We messed it up. So we've exchanged the glory of God for other images. And that uh, the results of idolatry are horrific. They're terrible. And, and Paul will go on to explain this principle and, and develop it further in uh, chapter 1. But what he's basically trying to say is he, he spends uh, the bulk of chapter 1 kind of talking about the Gentiles. So if you can imagine, in, in this context, any Jew that's reading this or hearing it read is probably like, yeah, those Gentiles, they're terrible, right? Well, guess what he does in chapter 2? Oh, and by the way, you Jews, y'all are in the same boat. You've done the exact same thing. So they're probably feeling pretty you know, self-righteous in chapter 1, and then all of a sudden he says, oh, by the way, yeah, you're no better. You've done the exact same thing. Jews and Gentiles. He, he lumps everybody together. And so we're equally sinful in the eyes of a holy God. Greg Gilbert, the author of that book, What is the Gospel? He, he said it this way. To have someone say to you, I'm coming to save you, is really not good news at all. Unless you believe you actually need to be saved. Think about that for a minute. You know who, the, who I think, this is just my opinion, you know who I think the most difficult person is to share the gospel with? Someone who at some point in their life has uh, walked an aisle or repeated a prayer or gone to a particular part in the room of a church and shook a preacher's hand and thought, all right, I'm good. No life change, no convictions, no true belief, no change in behavior at all, no salvation. But they're under the impression, I'm good, I got it. I, I did that when I was, I did that when I was, was eight years old, so I'm, I'm good. Now, and you look at their life at 38 or 40 or 50 or whatever, and wait a second. That's not what Christianity looks like. But they're thinking back to an eight-year-old shaking a preacher's hand and thinking they're fine. I've baptized a number of people with the same testimony. I, I went down and, and shook the preacher's hand and prayed a prayer when I was eight or nine or ten or twelve or whatever. And, but then I, when I got into high school and college, and then I, I realized um, I'm not saved. I'm not following Jesus. Now, I've heard it over and over and over again. So I'm, I'm tired of baptizing people who thought they were saved. Because that's the hardest person. You've got to get them lost. before you can, <laughs> You've got to show, uh, help them understand, what are you trusting for your salvation? Is it the shed blood of Christ on your behalf? Has it changed your life? And so our problem, we've rebelled against God. And so if people don't understand they need to be saved, then the news that somebody's coming to save them is no big deal. Because, well, oh, I'm good. I don't need that. I know I could probably name four or five of them just off the top of my head right now who truly believe they're going to heaven. I saw a, a statement on social media just uh, in the last few weeks. I can't remember when. Um, I think I've seen it more than once. And it said, you believe your faith will get you to heaven, but it won't get you to church on Sunday. Ouch. If your faith is not strong enough to get you to the fellowship of believers, even now and then, but you think it's going to carry you to heaven when you die, there's a problem with that. Right? There's a problem with that. We are accountable to God. Our problem is we've rebelled against God. Number three, God's solution to sin is the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So basically, his solution to our sin problem is his son, Jesus. This is the, the heart of the gospel, the good news that we need to hear. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 21. The righteousness of God has now been manifested apart from the law. Such great news. You can't keep the list of do's and don'ts and expect to be justified. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And then uh, a verse later, verse 23, and then in verse 24. And we know this is one of the pillars of the Roman road, right? We know verse 23, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you know what verse 24 says? Don't forget to keep reading. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because if you stop at verse 23, you're in a mess. Oh, well, I guess I've sinned. I fall short of the glory of God. Oh, well. No, you're, you're justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That's, that's great news. And so the important question at this point, as we've seen, okay, we're accountable to God. His wrath is revealed from heaven. We have rebelled against God, and that's our problem. We've exchanged the glory of God for images. We've committed gross idolatry. And then God has a solution to our sin problem, which is the death resurrection of His Son, Jesus. So here's the question about that. Leads us from number three to number four. How can this justification apply to me? Right? Because there's the principle. We're accountable to God. We have a sin problem, and uh, God has a solution justified by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ. Okay, well, how, how can I get in on that? Right? I don't want to just know that's the principle. I want to know, know it applies to me. I want to be saved. I want to be justified and forgiven. That's number four. The gospel tells us how we are included in this salvation. Romans chapter 3, the verse I skipped over, verse 22. Well, we read 21 and we went to 23 and 24, but Romans 3, 22 says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That's how this good news is for me and not just somebody else. I, I want it. And it says, believe in Jesus Christ. Believe. And in fact, if you were to read the entire Gospel of John, that whole Gospel is all about believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. That first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, turned the water into wine. Was it about the water and the wine? No, it was not. The Bible says he did this first miracle, his first sign, so his disciples would believe in him that he was the Christ. It's, it's all about believing in Jesus. And so when we see that we are indeed accountable to God, Romans 1, 21, we knew God, but we didn't honor him as God. We realize it's our sin problem, us, we're the problem. We exchange the glory of God for images resembling other things. God has a solution for our problem in the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. We've all sinned and fall short of His glory, but we're justified by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And then how we can lay hold of that. How, do, how does that become mine? Believe in Jesus Christ by faith. We have to believe. We have to trust Him alone to save us. So when we, when we see the... These points of the gospel, this is our 500-foot view, okay? So the gospel answers four crucial questions. Here's the questions. Who made us and to whom are we accountable? God. What's our problem? Why are we in trouble? Sin. How has God acted to save us from ourselves? Christ. How do I come to be included in this salvation? Respond. Respond to the truth of the gospel, to, to the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ, the whole story. That's the gospel, the good news. So God, man, Christ, response. 
That's the, the whole story of the Bible on a really low level, like a personal level. But here's the thing. If we were to zoom out and say, get up at cruising altitude, about 35,000 feet, and look down, Here's the big picture, and this might ring a few bells since we've talked about it before a couple times over the last few years. What is the big picture, the grand story of the whole Bible? Creation, fall, rescue, restoration. And here's the four questions that those things answer. How did everything begin? Creation. In the beginning, God. What went wrong? The fall, Genesis 3. Sin came into the picture. Is there any hope? Yes. Rescue by Jesus Christ. What will the future hold? Jesus is coming back. And he's going to restore everything to better than it was. Creation, fall, rescue, restoration. Those four questions are a huge uh, cruising altitude view of the same story. And when you zoom in and say, okay, well, that's how the story of the whole world in the Bible, what about me? How does that affect me? God, man, Christ, response. On a, on a very personal, very individual level, we find our place in God's story, not just in the overall creation of, of everything that is. And not just in the fall of man and the fall of creation and the breaking up of the harmony that existed. And then the look forward from Genesis 3 all the way to the New Testament where uh, everybody was looking forward to this Redeemer. All the prophets. Every, everybody pointing towards that time when Jesus was going to come. And so he came and he uh, accomplished the rescue mission. And then the future, he's coming back. So all the New Testament, after he lived and died and rose and ascended, now the focus is the gospel's going out. That story is being told. And then what are we looking forward to now? We're looking for him to come back, right? So that huge story, then we find our place in that because we realize we're accountable to that God who created everything. But we rebelled because we're included in that fall. So we sinned. And then we find our rescue in Christ. In what he did. He shed his blood. He rose from the dead. He accomplished redemption. And then we take part in that future restoration. Because we respond to the gospel. We, by faith, we believe in Jesus. And, and grab hold of that. And, and make it our own, right? So it's not just a principle. It's not just a nice story that somebody else gets to enjoy. It's my story. I'm in that story. And, and so Jesus died for me. He might, just like in uh, Psalm 23, you talk about a very personal account from David in Psalm 23. H how does it start? Anybody want to tell me the first few words? The Lord is, okay, what, what kind of pronoun is that? It's possessive. He might be a lot of people's shepherd, but the Lord is my shepherd. He, he's not just somebody else. He's my shepherd. That's a very close, personal, intimate connection. He, he, he's going to shepherd a lot of people, but he's going to shepherd me. He, he's my savior. He's not just the, you know, yeah, he died for the sins of the world, but guess what? I'm in the world. Me. He died for me, not just mankind. So that story, although it's big, it's the story of the whole Bible, but it's also the story of the believer, the individual Christian, that God is the creator, so we're accountable to him. We rebelled and sinned, so we broke our relationship but Christ is our solution because he died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the grave to complete the redemptive story. And then we respond with faith and believe in him and trust only him for our salvation. 
It's creation, fall, rescue, restoration. God, man, Christ, response. Now, before we think that, well, that's just in Romans. You know, some people actually think if the Bible only says it one time, that's not enough. It's got to say it a bunch of times for it to be true. Well, you know, I won't take time to explain why that's stupid. But there are other places where the gospel is explained and mentioned in, in maybe less detail. But, for example, you could... And this may be the most simple expression of the gospel in the whole New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And Paul writes to this church. He says, let me just read it to you. He says, now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel. That's the Gospel. Christ died for our sins just like the Bible said He would. And just like the Bible said He did. And then He was buried. And then He was raised on the third day. Exactly how the Bible said, according to the Scriptures. And there's another one, and there's several more. I'll just give you this one other one. Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. Now, this is really cool because here we're in the part of Acts where uh, now the Gentiles are getting in on it, right? Because they go to the Jews first, and the Jews, judge, as the Bible says, judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. So we're turning to the Gentiles. And thank goodness... They turn to the Gentiles, right? Because that's us. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. But Acts 13, 38 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Remember what Paul said in Romans 3? The righteousness of God is being manifested apart from the law. I don't have to be good enough because I can't be. Jesus was good enough for me. So I, I don't have to try to stack up my good works and minimize my bad works. Now, won't we do that? that that's, that's a good thing, right? It's good to be nice, isn't it? It's good to be nice. It's good to be kind. It's good to be forgiving. It's good to, to be generous. And it's good to not be all those opposites and be all the bad things. But that's not going to get you to heaven. That's our response. That's what we do not so we can be saved. That's what we do because we've been saved. It's our response to the love of Jesus. So then we get to see... It's not just the big picture, it's also our personal, individual picture. That when we see that we're accountable, and we see that we've rebelled, and we see God has sent a solution, and we respond in faith and believe. And l let me just close by saying this. The most um, convicting evidence of true repentance is a change of behavior. When your life begins to transform, then you start to realize, I met Jesus and I got a full dose and I've never gotten over it. And it's showing itself in my thoughts and my attitudes and my words, my actions. Now, it's not, uh, I'm not sinless. I still mess up. But there's a change. It, there's a change in my life that apart from Christ is unexplainable. Just think about that for a second. When, when you realize that 
the difference in you would be impossible apart from the Holy Spirit of God. That's when you start to realize that there really is something to this salvation. It's not just a story. It is transformational truth. And that's why we believe it. Because it's not just words on a page. It's not man written. It's God inspired truth. Every bit of it. And it changes our lives. And it glorifies God. And it will change other people's lives. And so that's why Paul wasn't ashamed of it. And that's why he wanted to tell everybody. Because it really is the power of God for salvation to all those who believe. Let's pray.